I guess like the first question is like, what was the, uh, I guess like the precipice that you came to, to write this book? Um, understanding, beginning uh, to research the colonial laws that when you go back specifically to the 17th and 18th century, white people are writing their intentions for black people into those laws. So mm, come on. if I can give you an example. Please do. Um, and this is one of a body of many of laws that emerged during the 17th century. And it's the 1669 Casual Killing Act, which said, uh, whereas the only law enforced for the punishment of refractory servants resisting their master, mistress, or overseer cannot be inflicted upon Negroes because they're too stubborn. We need something stronger for the... Uh, nor th okay, sorry. Be it enacted and declared by this grand assembly that if any slave resists his master or other, any other person put in charge by the master's order that's uh, put in, given authority to correct that black person, if the black person should happen to die by the extremity of the correction, that the death should not be accounted a felony. Mm. And so when you see laws that are enacted that say be, because of the pursuit that we have to economize black bodies and build an empire, we're implementing laws to shape the uh, cultural dynamics because we need to implement a certain degree of control. Mm -hmm. If when you are correcting these black people, if you happen to kill them, that their death is not accounted a felony, and then also they can't defend themselves because there were later laws that were enacted that said if a black person raises their hand to a white person trying to defend themselves, they are to be given 30 lashes on their back. Mm. And if they resist being apprehended from running away from the terrorism, if you happen to kill them, it won't be a felony. And so I started to say, wow. Christianity and the way that it was implemented here in America and then its transition into whiteness because first they were identifying everyone as Christian, mm -hmm. but once they started to convert African and Indians into Christianity, they, tran they transcended into white, into whiteness. Mm -hmm. So you've got white culture that is founded as a terrorist organization. It's a terroristic culture. And so if you want to investigate anything about black people and blackness and black culture, even the violence angry aspects, mm. we evolved out of a violent culture. And so all of the anger and rage that people pathologize about black people, it's a cultural relevant response mm. to terrorism enacted by white people. Um, but I think it's also like hearing that it explains why we've seen for the last 10 years, right, um, that we've seen black people shot down by police mm -hmm. or killed by white citizens like George Zimmerman, and those individuals not really suffer any real consequences, right? So it's like this law written in 1669 is in effect still kind of like the law today because when white people kill us, they're rarely face the the full consequences of the law, particularly if they're police officers. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to invite you all right here on the spot to attend a two-day virtual class that I teach. I'm going to allow you to attend it for free. You can just audit it. Mm. You have this example of this one law in 1669. Right. Now what I, I need you all to understand is are the layers of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because there, this one law represents a plethora of laws, a cadre of laws that are implemented throughout each of the centuries. It's followed up. For example, in 1690 in the Carolinas, you have the whole white race that is required by law to become a racial police force against African Americans. Oh, wow. And when we transcend or uh, into the United States of America, the United States Supreme Court in 1850 under the Fugitive Slave Act required every white American in the country to become a racial police force against black people. What you that was the first racial draft, right? Before Dave Chappelle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so, but I say that because what you have to understand is that white people have been commissioned and given cultural licensure yes. to yeah. police black bodies, both in and out of slavery. Mm -hmm. And I also think the overemphasis on the institution of slavery serves to diminish conversation around the motivating factor for racial slavery, which is anti-blackness. Yes, and and this this is a generational theme that exists because when white people people approach us 
always with agencies. Like, yeah. you have to listen to me. I have authority The Karens, over you. right? Yeah. The we, Karens, we just, the Kins. We just had just, a clip. Just had this on it. Where a black woman was walking into a hotel, minding her black business on, on her, her birthday. birthday. <laughs> on her birthday. <laughs> More like to that sister. And a white woman was like, told her, you can't be here. And the person who worked for the hotel said, like, ma'am, you don't work for this hotel. Yeah. Like, what gave you the authority to think? You don't even work there. But to think that you had this agency over this black woman yeah. and then spit in this black woman's face. Mm-hmm. Now, shout out to our sister. Absolutely. She you gave know, her she them put hands. the paws on yes. her. She, she gave her a birthday she gave, beating. She <laughs> gave her a buffet of hands. That's all <laughs> that was. Which she deserved. But like you said, we see this karen in and we kind of we laugh and joke about it, but you're able to put into, by law, like the historical context yeah. then, that is why white people still think that way today. When we're walking down the street, you think you can police us. And, yes. and that's what I said. It's a generational theme. It's something, this, it's, it's, it's a relic of the 1600s. It's a 400-year Holocaust, come, my brother. Come on. Come on. <laughs> come on.